nailed our hearts unto you at this conference. We have been honest. Lord, we have been forthright with you, not trying to put on airs, not trying to be perfect. Oh God, and then we have gained access into your throne room, not because we can carelessly walk into it, but because you are gracious, because we are willing to look deep into your eyes, Lord, into your capillaries. Oh God, we don't take it for granted that we can boldly access the throne. We humbly come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. There is nothing impossible to you, and we are your children. Lord, we don't take it for granted. We're not entitled, God, but we are your kids. Oh, Jesus, all that we have gained, all that is in our hearts, let us go home. Let us write out the notes. Let us journal. Let us re-listen to the messages. God, further let us delve into the deepness that you have begun, that you have started in this conference and wherever we are going in the Northeast, Lord, that we would take it home, Lord, that we would marinate on it, Lord, that we would grow in it in the mighty name of Jesus. We walk with the full armor of God. We are not weak. God, when the enemy looks at us, he is looking at you because we are putting on your helmet of salvation your blessed plate of righteousness, your belt of truth, your shoes of the gospel of peace, your shield of faith that we may quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. God, it doesn't just happen. We have to be vigilant. We have to be aware. We have to, we have to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked through the shield of faith in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, thank you for that offensive weapon of the sword of your spirit help us oh God to delve into your word every day oh God not just to lightly read over it Lord but to put your word in our hearts thank you Jesus thank you Jesus Lord let us take what we have received and let us carry it back to our homes in Pennsylvania in New York, in New Jersey, in Vermont, in New Hampshire, in Maine, God, in Massachusetts, Lord, everywhere that people are, Lord, in the Northeast, send great revival. Lord, that our cities, God, we can't do it in our own might and our own power, but by your might and your power in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we are asking that you would help us to take the tools, Lord, to not fix people, Lord, but that we may just show them you, show them the King of kings and Lord of lords. In the name of Jesus, anoint every one of the brothers and sisters. If they came here feeling discouraged, if they came here ready to throw in the towel, help them to march out like a soldier for you. Help them, Lord, to have the renewed strength in the mighty name of Jesus. Nothing is impossible to you. And we stand boldly as we walk in the armor of God. Send your angels in the four corners of wherever you've sent us. Oh God, where two or three are gathered, you are right here in the midst. And many, many more have gathered today. Lord, we know your angels are guarding all around this sanctuary. We plead your blood over this sanctuary. Lord, and as we step out of this building, we know it will not be just ankle deep, but we know that it will be knee deep in the name of Jesus as we go back to our homes. 
We know that it will be hip deep. We know that we're eventually not going to be able to walk in it, but we will swim. God, that you will use us to go back to our homes and bring great revival in the Northeast. Oh God, send the souls. Send the souls. We are hungry, Jesus. We trust you. We love you in these end times. There is nothing you won't do to reach out to that soul. Oh God, help us to reach the hungry. Who is hungry now? And we will reach out to them in the name of Jesus. Give us boldness. Give us boldness in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Great are you, Lord. You are kind and you are good in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. There's something that's so powerful when the children of God get together. Praise God. There is nothing that can stand before us. There is no devil in hell. There is no force that can resist us. Praise God. I learned a powerful, uh, you know, experience, praise God, as I was growing up as a child that if I go to my parents and I ask for something by myself, many times I wouldn't be able to get it. But if I went with my siblings, there was a surety that I was gonna get the attention of my parents. Anybody can say amen to that? Today we have gathered as siblings and we've come to petition our Father. And I just wanna let you know that if you would lift up your voices today in prayer, he will hear, he will answer, and he will give access. Praise God. Amen. Anybody believe that today? Praise God. And so we're gonna lift up our voices in prayer again. And today we're gonna pray for apostolic harvest. Praise God. We're gonna pray for apostolic harvest. But not only are we going to pray for harvest, but we're going to pray with an understanding that in order for harvest to take place, then harvesters will need to be sent. Amen. And so if you don't mind just lifting up your voice and forgetting about your neighbor for a moment, and let's begin to petition the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you right now for the calling upon your people. We thank you right now for the great apostolic harvest that's coming to this region, oh God. We believe, Lord Jesus, that you have promised in your word that there would be a great overflow, there'd be a great move of your spirit, that sons and daughters, that every kindred, tribe, and tongue, nation, and peoples would come in the last day. And we pray, oh God, that you would fulfill as your word has declared Lord Jesus as you're moving Lord God we are reminded in the book of Matthew when you describe to the disciples how they ought to pray send forth laborers into the vineyard God Almighty we pray that you will reach and begin to pull men and begin to pull women and begin to pull children of every kindred tribe tongue nation and people God send them forth into the harvest field to bring forth the great abundance that you promised in this end time. We pray right now in the name of Jesus. Come on, children of God. Let's petition him. Let's petition him. Let's petition him. God, we need you to move. We need you to move. We need you to move. There is desolation all around us. There is destruction. There is heartache and pain. Hearts are torn, Lord God. But Lord Jesus, even now, you can harvest them for your kingdom we believe it we claim it now in the name of Jesus Christ in the name of Jesus Christ hallelujah 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 Carbasar di bardahan y dar total, prasam runi avrahan, caprasati prati tordania, sarvatur nathisal, pramatur da samnar de hel, cabratani sil, 
Arte surda in ya Arte manatu Hasiamatu In the name of Jesus In the name of Jesus Praise God The word of God tells us in the book of Matthew chapter 20 As the Lord began to describe a parable Amen Of the kingdom of God And he depicts a uh, a husbandman, praise God, a, a landowner that was going out into, praise God, into the marketplace and into the streets. And he was picking up people that were either idle or just willing and ready to work. Praise God. And today I want to pray a special prayer. And maybe you could create a point of contact with your neighbor as we pray this prayer. Praise God that if your neighbor, if you have been idle for a little while, Praise God that you would realize that it's time to go into the vineyard. Amen. Praise God. I know we've heard a lot today and there's been a lot that's happened over this, these few days, praise God, in this conference. But believe it or not, there's still some among us that may be sitting idle. Praise God. They've had a wonderful time in conference, but they're preparing to go home and sit back in their same seats. Praise God, but we cannot afford to do that. We've got to be busy in the master's vineyard. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. The marketplace that was described in Matthew chapter 20 was a place of congregation. It was a place like this. But praise God, the master says, I want you to leave the marketplace and to go into my field. Because the supply that's required for the marketplace, it resides in the field. And so let's pray for our neighbor today that God will shake something within us, praise God, that will jolt us to go out into the vineyard, into the field, and to labor while it is day. Come on, saints of God, let's lift up our voices. Pray for them like you want them to pray for you. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Surtimatateu. Pratatas turnan, ni pratasu tardi pra anil, kapratu sor mania terabal, mandulu, yara. Oh, let there be no idol in your kingdom, Lord. Let there be no idol in your kingdom, Lord. Cause us to labor while it is day to reach into the harvest until every soul that you've marked is saved. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. God, we glorify your name. We worship you and exalt you. We bless your holy, wonderful, wonderful name. Precious Savior, wonderful Counselor, mighty God, Prince of Peace. Lord, we thank you for your gracious goodness and love that we feel just saturating this sanctuary this morning. We're the grateful recipients of your love and your mercy, your tender mercies, your long-suffering. We exalt you, Lord. God, I pray as we move into this forum time together today, that you would lose insight and revelation and give wisdom. And God, that even beyond that, that we would receive it, not simply as hearers. The, the, we're not hearers only that are gathered here today. We're doers of the word. But in this area that we're discussing today, Sometimes we fail to give it the attention, the cultivation that it needs in our lives. So I pray, God, you would give us inside information, wisdom, knowledge, revelation. And just as in so many other areas of 
wisdom that you've given. We've gone beyond hearing to doing that here today we would also become doers of the word. You're the potter, we're clay. Mold us, Lord Jesus, into your image. We magnify you. We bless your name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's give God a great hand clap of praise, of thanksgiving. Amen. For the sake of time, I'm going to be very brief as our panelists on the forum come to the platform. You know, my wife is such an incredible example, and I'm so, so blessed that God graced my life with her 21 years ago, and uh, we were eating some dinner last night with uh, a few of the speakers, and one said, Sis Petoskey, I just love how you introduce people. It makes me want to be them. I'm going to fail to rise to the bar of Dr. Petoskey this morning, um, but we are blessed to have with us moderating this panel, Dr. Cindy Miller, who didn't she bless us yesterday with a wonderful word from the Lord. And Dr. Stephen Beardsley serving as pastor in Newark. Delaware for many years, a professor at Urshan and, and served in different roles, capacities there. Um, Dr. Daniel Surstad and Pastor Marie Brown, who has a story as a teenage youth being in a vehicle going to a lock-in in Massachusetts that may or may not have true components of the youth leaders driving. I am the said youth leader and have some notable driving experiences. Um, but I'm so grateful for each of them. And Dr. Daniel Surstad, I so appreciate his ministry, Apostolic Moral Purity. Every youth department, every hyphen ministry, campus ministry needs to have a connection to this ministry. It is a battle that our youth and our children are facing. Many of you are probably already aware that the average age of a child discovering porn is eight. The last research I saw. We're foolish as a church to pretend like we can't talk about these things to our kids. Their school teachers are talking to them about it. Their classmates are talking to them about it. And if you're not talking to them about it, they're not gaining the right biblical foundation for their life. So I won't take any further time. God bless you. you. may be seated, and I'll let Sister Miller take it away. Thank you. Good morning. I want to applaud all of you. Okay. It can, they can go ahead and pass it out now. You're going to be receiving a handout. Thank you for braving the cold uh, to come out and be with us this morning. And I am honored to be with this platform panel, uh, dear friends and uh, new friends, longtime friends and new friends. So today we're going to be talking about the missing element in ministers' lives. And so for the next 45 minutes, or if we really get going and get carried away, an hour and a half, two hours, whatever, we'll be discussing this critical need for friendships and connections among ministers. So I want to uh, get started, and you've already been introduced, so it's Dr. Beardsley, Sister Marie Brown, Dr. Daniel Surstead here with me. Uh, people often mean different things when they're discussing descriptors like good friends, authentic friends, acquaintances, and knowing you know, what's important in those circles. And so I thought it would be good if we could define some terms before we get started. And I'm going to start with Dr. Beardsley and ask you, Dr. Beardsley, if you would kind of define for us this term circle of trust and what that means and a little bit of what that looks like. Well, first of all, let me say thank you to my friend John and Rick 
and the rest of the committee that has given us the privilege of being here. And uh, it's with a bit of trepidation that I join this panel, given that it's being led by Dr. Cindy Miller, because the last time that she and I collaborated on something in a public fashion, <laughs> she changed the rules without telling me. I and it was, his life. it was, I it was his life. embarrassing. <laughs> if you all would like to know the story, come see me afterwards. See me, she's gonna tell you a whole different story. He exaggerates. It's comedy hour. Not only Sam Emery can be a comedian. Anyway, so let's talk about circle of trust, friends, acquaintances. And so one of the things that I think is very important is to recognize um, that different people and uh, have different roles, and they're very valuable. So here's how I would define it. I think within our movement, we struggle because we call people friends who are actually acquaintances. So let me give you an example. So as already been referenced in my bio, I served for 14 years uh, in various capacities at Urshan Graduate School of Theology. As such, I worked fairly closely with Dr. David Bernard before he was general superintendent. Brother Bernard is an acquaintance. It's an acquaintance that I trust it's an acquaintance because of the number of years that we've worked together that I even share information with that I don't just share with everyone else. But if I go and say, hey, Dr. Bernard is my close friend, I'm misrepresenting. Dr. Bernard has never seen me with my hair a mess. Of course, no, nobody's seen me with my hair a mess, I understand. But uh, he's, never, he's never seen me disheveled. He's never seen me wear my track pants that are so comfortable that they have one knee worn out. John has. Rick has. So I think for our definitions, acquaintances are people who fulfill roles, but those roles are usually organizational, they're structural, they're um, and they're important. You can even have great times with them. You can share meals with them. You can know personal details about them. But a circle of trust or friends are people whose primary, if not only, role in your life is to walk with you Amen. through life. Right. They don't, they're going to walk with you when you're a jerk. They're going to walk with you when you're at your high. Yeah. And, when you're, and when you're at your high, they're not going to be impressed with you. That's right. They're going to celebrate you. Every time John steps to this stage and gives a keynote, I celebrate the man's talents, but I'm not impressed. <laughs> because I have all of these other experiences and things of, of my role within his life that situates me differently and so I think acquaintances can fill a lot of different roles and some of those acquaintances can be very close and in kindness we would call them friends but what we're talking about here today in a circle of trust and in friends that are accountability that if we break through a wall and a snake bites us they're there to help suck the venom out if we're quarrying and a rock falls on us, they help move the rock so we get out. If we dig a pit and we fall in, they're the one throwing the rope down to pull us back out. Those friends, first and foremost responsibility is to one another. And that requires a level of vulnerability and a level of relationship that's not an acquaintance. I don't know if that helps, but there's my start. So if we, if we use the term circle of trust, we can also, we're really saying close friends, close friends. All right, so I want to also move into talking about um, the experience with recognizing the need for close friendships. You know, what the Bible says in Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loveth at all times and a brother is born for adversity. Uh, so, but knowing that we need to build these strong relationships, these circle of trust, these friendships, um, you know, it's not easy. That's not an easy thing to do. So, Dr. Sir said, what is your experience with recognizing the need for close friendships? 
Well, let me say that it's been an honor to be here, and I'm kind of the outsider, but many of you have helped me to feel like I'm part of the crew, part of the group here. Appreciate that. The need for friends. I, I walked into the, uh, I'm staying at the Hilton Garden Inn, or I was before I checked out. I walked in Wednesday night, 1130. Never seen the guy at the desk before in my life. And he said, how are you doing, my friend? <laughs> that was kind of interesting. I've never seen him before, never seen him since. And I do agree with Dr. Beardsley, our definition for friends is is quite questionable uh, i know folks that have hundreds of best friends and i've scratched my head on that how do you have hundreds of best friends that just doesn't equate with the verbiage but there are times in our lives that we go through things that we don't want we just don't want anybody and we need somebody we need somebody that will walk in when others walk out. We need a friend that will tell us what we don't want to hear. We need a friend that will tell us what we need to hear. We need a friend that will be real, be honest, be trustworthy, that we can feel safe with. One of, one of the definitions of uh, trust, which is a part of the definition of friend, is the word safe. And in a world that we live in, we need a place of safety. And I understand that we find that refuge in Christ, but God put people in our life for a reason. And uh, I'm, I'm very grateful and appreciative of that. So there's also a term that we look at, and it's called casual friends and vital others. And it was actually you, Dr. Sir, said that you, you used that term casual friends in a previous conversation. And, and then we also, we look at what is the role of the body of Christ or elders, pastors, leaders, you know, parents. I, I wouldn't call them, oh, you know, my, my elder is my close friend, but these are vital others. Um, Sister Brown, what do you think? What do you think about vital others, body of Christ? Um, it's very important to, um, and I'm the silly one, by the way. I'm sorry. Um, the funny one. Yes. Uh, well, I try to be. <laughs> um, it's important to have friends. It's important to be connected to the body. Um, and... Uh, you're going to have to repeat that question again because, you know, I just heard it and it just flew out of my mind. So in your life, you have close friends. Yes, I do. And you have that circle of trust. Amen. But outside of that, I mean, how do you define those vital voices that you need to hear? Um, you know, so it's not just unless you're my best friend, you can't speak into my life. Right. So what is the role of the body of Christ or elders? You have to remain connected. You have to be re, uh, remain connected to the body of Christ. God has put us in a family, and um, and that is the body of Christ. We we need elders in our lives. We need people that can check us at any time. Um, we need a pastor over our lives, and just because I'm a pastor or I'm a first lady, doesn't mean that that's the end. And I'm at the highest level and no one can check me. Um, that's not okay. Because we are all human, we have flaws, and we're prone to sin, and we need somebody to check us on a higher level, not just peers. And we see that in the error of that in the Word of God with Solomon's son who just spoke with his peers, but didn't listen to the voice of the elders in his life. And that's not okay. They had wise counsel, but he chose to go with his peers. And peers are important, but elders keep you grounded. 
They're the ones who put those standards in your life. They're the ones that built you up. And you can't forget about them um, and what they've taught you. Uh, you know, coming into the, this role of a pastor's wife in the past four or five years, the Lord has cemented some things in my life. Uh, you know, do you believe this for yourself? And I had to go back to what my elders taught me and why they put those landmarks there. Why it's so important not to remove the ancient landmarks. And so I can't, if they put that there, it's for a reason. So I need to listen to my elders. I can't just go with what my peers are saying. Well, this is acceptable and we can do this now. Or, you know, you're a pastor's wife, you can change. No, I can't change it. If anything, I have to keep those standards and raise the bar. So, you know, it's, I don't get to move it. I just don't get to move it. I, I allow the Lord to cement that. So I need elders. I need a pastor over my life. I need the fivefold ministry over me. I can't just have a pastor and that's it. I need to be able to have an evangelist speaking into my life. I need to be able to have the prophet speaking into my life. And, you know, just a quick note on that. A few years ago when my mother was deathly ill, she passed away two years this, uh, this May, this coming May with cancer, that previous September prophet spoke into my life and said, uh, you're going to have people in your life that are going to try to get you to take on their responsibilities. And the Lord says, it is not for you to take on. And he said, even family members, and it's not for you to take on their burdens, their responsibilities. And that was a sure word. Because knowing me wanting to take care of people, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to go run and save everybody. Um, but that kept me grounded. And I needed the voice of my husband. I needed the voice of my pastor, which is now my husband, but also my bishop, Bishop Warren Tryon. He's the bishop over our church. Uh, you know, I need to be submitted to my district board. I need to be submitted to all those levels that are over me. So it's not just close friends, but it's that. So we're looking at the value of vital voices. So elders, pastors, uh, every, you know, everyone that is going to contribute and help us grow. But we're going to go back to this missing piece because a lot of times we are all willing to be submitted to the elders. We're willing to, you know, this is my my bishop, my district superintendent, my general superintendent, I'm submitted. But though they speak into our lives and they're vital to us, do we open up? Do we become vulnerable in a way? Do we let them see? Because we, we want them to be impressed with us. I mean, I want them to think well of me. So I want to kind of transition this into these really close circles that uh, a couple of us up here have. And I'm going to start with you, Dr. Beardsley, because I know that accountability and uh, these connected circles of friendship are, have been something you've been intentional about all your life, or as long as I can remember. So talk to us about how you are connected and maybe a little bit about this uh, born of four that I keep hearing about. So let me answer this question by giving you a concrete example of the difference between what I call acquaintances um, in that circle of people that we trust, we're accountable to, we may even be in submission to in various roles versus those close friends. So I'm in the midst of a, of a transition, literally one week from this Sunday, I return home uh, to Newark, where I will preside over an annual business meeting in which the congregation will vote on a name change and on a structural change. And if they do so, um, I will then tender a letter of resignation from Newark, which June of 2020, the Lord spoke to me and said, your time here is done. I have no idea where I am going and I am leaving the church in the hands of a team of pastors. Now, you all just sit there for about 30 seconds and chew on all of that. 
I mean, that's got, that's got a bunch of legs on it. I had my wife, while I was in the shower this morning, count up. Who are the people that I'm really vulnerable with about this? Brother Bernard's been aware of it. But it's not his role to say yay or nay. I need people that will look at me and say, Steve, what are you thinking? I need people who will stress test me hard. I need people who will support me when I'm scared. I'm breaking through a wall, but there's snakes showing up. I'm, I'm, I'm quarrying out a rock that's going to be a foundation stone for the future. But it, it might fall on me. So I had my wife count up, and I have that I was accountable to, that I was vulnerable with, that I was transparent with, that they knew all of my fears, they knew what was going on. I had 17 people in various levels of accountability and various levels of vulnerability. Not a one of them had an organizational position. If they did, their role in my life was not as an organizational leader. These were people that, as it happened, I called them. So I told you in June, the Lord spoke to me, and by the end of July, there were three guys that I would consider my closest friends. It's the result of the vision of John Petoskey. The man is a vision machine. And he called these three friends together. I'm one of them. And every one of us, I kid you not, when we first came to this retreat that he says, I just want to get together. Every one of us had a plan to escape, <laughs> to leave early. Not a one of us told him that, but we all had distress signals to send out that would then get a call that would then say, hey, I'm sorry, guys, but something's come up. I got to go. <laughs> and I am not lying. Every one of us, we have laughed about this so many times because we were, we were not sure what he was up to. If you're not scared, if you're not nervous, then you're not vulnerable. That's right. That's right. That's the bottom line. If you're not scared, if you're not nervous, then you're not vulnerable. That's right. I've written Brother Bernard many times through this transition. I've never once been scared because I know that we're a congregational model, and as strong as his leadership is, he's never going to walk in there and tell me. He'll remonstrate with me. He might try to appeal to me, but he's not going to walk in and take over. But when I sit down with these three guys... There's times I'm scared. Are they going to reject me? Yes. Are they going to try to fix me? Because no. I don't need them to fix me. Right. I need them to walk with me while I am trying to figure out what's going on. I need them to speak truth to me. Yes, absolutely. But I need them to speak truth and then leave it in my hands. I need a place that my wife knows that if I am out of control, and I'm not talking about out of control, irritating. That's like every day. I'm talking about where the train's going off the tracks. Who does she call in on me? She doesn't need to call a district official in on me because that creates a whole other set of problems. She needs to call some friends in on me that know me. They know my breath stinks in the morning. They've seen my hair messed up, or most people's hair messed up. They've seen my track pants with holes in the knees. They have spent time with me. We have celebrated one another. We have cried together. We have had fun together. We have been doing life together. So they come in and they intervene. Dr. Miller, you spoke of intervention, and I think there are times. Who can intervene in your life? Who can arrest your movement and cause you to pause? Now, I have other friends that I literally have on a, on a rotation in my tasks that I call every few weeks. It's very intentional because you can't draw, you can't draw well from an 
or can't draw water, excuse me, from an empty well. Correct. Well, how do you make a well? You have to invest in it. So I have conversations, and it's hard. Some of these friends are busy, and I'll tell you flat out that some of them, if I wouldn't call them, we wouldn't have it. But I do call them, and then we spend two hours talking. And so I have this closest that has, we're now heading for 10 years that we have been doing life together, and I am forever, and I mean this, forever indebted to John. He's a crazy man. He's off the chain. He leaves a trail of destruction in his wake as he visions. Come on, folks. Can I get an amen? I know there's some people in the house that know what I'm talking about. He leaves a trail of destruction that his friends pick up and, and make him look good on. But I am forever indebted to this man for saying, hey, Steve, I'd like to do life with you. And I got a couple of other guys that I think we could do life together. I'm forever indebted to those other guys, Rick and Michael, that you, you agreed and you've hung with me. But then I also have other friends that are inside of that system that are just as vital to me. They've chosen me. I'll name one of them, Russ Bear, National Bible Quiz Director. He and I quiz together. And he says, people will ask me, because Russ is a very different personality than me, speaks very different than me, et cetera. And people will ask him, how, how, how does this work? And he says, hey, Steve's an acquired taste. <laughs> and then he said, and it's one of the best things I've ever ha heard from someone, he says, but I've acquired the taste. And we've tested that a couple of times. He's my friend. He's not going to try to fix me. He's walked with me. He's, the best way I can put it, Dr. Miller, is, is you need people who their primary role is to do life with you. Absolutely. Not run your boards, not run your churches. Not, all those people are important too. But do life with you. John couple years ago decided I should serve on his board. I won't tell you the details of how he said that, but I'm covering a friend. I called him and I said, John, I don't want to serve on your board. He said, because if I choose to serve on your board, I'm going to have a responsibility to that church and to that board. And that's going to put me in a potential conflict with being your friend. And for me, the number one priority with regard to John Petoskey is to be his friend. Good. Nothing more. Well, I think maybe you should reconsider taking that board position because after everything you said about him, I think he's going to replace you in that born of four. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> I, was, I was privileged to work on a research study about eight years ago, and it was looking at how pastors remain, uh, are, you know, continue in ministry in a successful way. And really what it came down to in the findings was if you have a network of support, you're going to make it. You have to have this network of support. And that's what uh, Dr. Beardsley's talking about, what we're all trying to say today in so many ways, not leaving one, one empty spot, but having filled every gap to make sure that you're able to, to do this. But this is hard work, right? You know, you're looking, you're looking at us and going, oh, sure, you're up there because you've done the hard work. I don't even know where to start, but we're going to help with that. Pastor Brown, you're a very busy woman, and, uh, but yet you're part of a team, a, a close network of support. I think you call it the dream team. Or they call it the dream team. I'm not sure. But talk a little bit about how it's for, how you formed that. And then let's look at the season of life you were in when you were actually able to do this. Because not every season of life allows us to have, you know, we don't have the resources, the time, energy, or even maybe finances to do some things. Do you want to talk about that? Um, well, my husband and I, we have four children, 17 and under, <laughs> 17, 15, 
12, about to be 13 in two weeks, and a seven-year-old. Three boys and a girl. Very busy household. Miracle I didn't start getting grays until we became pastors. <laughs> I always said by the time I turn 30, I'm going to have a twitch, you know. I'm past that. I don't have, I don't know. It comes in and goes from time to time. Um, but um, I remember getting phone calls from friends. We had moved back to Connecticut from Minnesota from Bible College. And at the time, we only had one son, but, you know, our family grew. My kids are two to three years apart, and then Lucy is five years apart. Anyway, um, and they would call and say, hey, you want to hang out? We're having a girls' night, or we're having this. And I would have to say, I'm sorry. Just don't have the finances. Young family. Don't have the time. Because right now is my, my children's bedtime, and I have to be able to put them to bed. And I have responsibilities. And that, was, that, is, that is my primary responsibility. Um, and I tried. One of the things that kept uh, me connected to the body was going to rallies, going to district events. Um, even though I had friends and I had some, we had friends, not close friends. I came to find that out a few years ago. And, um, but that, going to rallies, going to district events, our ministers and wives retreat. That's how you build friends. That's how you get connected to the body and you stay connected because you need that adult time. <laughs> Can't be talking to kids all day. <laughs> Go crazy. Um, and uh, so, 20s. Not, it wasn't until I was about 35, so five years ago, um, that we were just going to our regular district events, um, but more our ministers and wives retreat, just connecting with other ministers that are in the trenches with you, in the district, that know this region, that know what it's like to, you know, do work together, and our dream team. That's how it came about. We started playing Uno. <laughs> yes. They got to know me. Um, <laughs> all right. Don't like to let people see that too much. Let me guess. You're a cutthroat. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, my husband will tell you very um, competitive. Um, firstborns. We're both firstborns, so like competition. Anyway, um, but that's how we got together. Alita. Alita Rumpf. She was the one that just glued us together. Um, just a social butterfly. And, you know, social butterflies are attracted to social butterflies. And, uh, you know, it was, it was Tia, Alita, and I. And I'm, I'm calling out names right now, but that's all right. Um, and it was just the three of us at first. Our husbands weren't even really connected. They would just hang out because we were hanging out. And, uh, but then we just drew close together. Um, and we started having times together. We started hanging out, going out to eat. Next thing you know, we're coming over to my house. And that's not my house anymore. That's our house. That's our house where we gather together where we come, we have good fellowship, and we let our hair down. Chris doesn't have any hair, but that's all right. <laughs> he lets it down anyway. We joke around, and, um, but then after that, we minister to one another. We are real. We are real with each other. Um, and about three years ago, We lost Alita. And it hit us hard. And we just drew closer together. 
we just rallied around Chris. You know, he, he wasn't able to be vulnerable with anybody at the time. She had cancer, and she hadn't told anyone. I knew something was wrong. Tia and I knew something was wrong, but she wouldn't say anything. And in that close-knit circle, I remember Chris reached out to Aaron and Lewis and said, I have to talk to somebody because if I don't, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And by the way, I have, I have Chris's permission to talk about this, so don't think that I'm just putting somebody's business out there without first checking with my friend, uh, with my brother. But that... He had to call them. And then he said, delete this because I don't want anybody else to find out. Guess what? That was sealed shut. Nobody knew. Nobody knew that, that Elite had cancer. For months, she was pregnant, and she's carrying this baby, and nobody else knew. We found out the last few months, and we were there holding her hand, holding Chris's hand. I remember the last time we got together as the dream team before she passed away. She was so fearful. You could feel it. But she made the best of it. We hung out. We sat. We loved on each other. We joked around. And we prayed. We prayed over her and we sang the blessing over her. And there was such a peace that came in that room. And we just knew no matter what happens, God has got us. God has got us. And this is our family. We're not just friends. This is family right here. And, you know, it was no more than, what, two weeks later, she passed away, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we just rallied around Chris. We loved on him. And there have been times in each and every one of us not just Chris. <sighs> when I lost my mother two years ago to cancer, battled, she battled for five years. There were so many things that happened. And I couldn't talk about it with just anybody. But I could talk about it with my dream team. And I remember just sitting in our house. And again, we would joke around, we would cry together, but it always turned into ministry. And God just used each and every one of us to prophesy to one another, to pray for one another, to be vulnerable with one another. Because that's what happens. When we are vulnerable with one another, when we are real, ministry happens. We are not meant to be islands. We are not meant to be islands. And just one more thing. The Lord had given me a scripture. It was Psalm 68, verse 5 and 6, and I'll read it in the Christian Standard Bible. God is in his holy dwelling, is a father of the fatherless and a champion of widows. God provides homes for those who are deserted. He leads out of the out the prisoners to prosperity, but the rebellious live in a scorched land. He says he puts the solitary in families, and he brings out them that are bound with chains. He sets them free, but they're rebellious, dwell in a dry land. God has placed us in the body, in his body. We are not meant to be islands. We are not meant to be disconnected from each other. We have to find a place where we're vulnerable with each other. And you can't do that if you're not congregating, if you're not being intentional. And I'm so thankful for the Dream Team because I can be vulnerable. And that took work to create. It doesn't just happen. You have to create this, these relationships. You have to be intentional. You have to show yourself friendly. But you're a part of the body of Christ. And so if you make yourself an island, then you're going to be in a parched place and rebellious because you're not uniting yourself with the body of Christ. God's coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, and he's coming back for a bride that's whole. 
Thank we you. need to be whole. We need to come together as a body. Thank you so much for sharing. Cindy, before you move on, let me add one quick thing, and I mean a quick thing. You will not have these close relationships until you have gone through brokenness and suffering together. Amen. Amen. Brokenness and suffering that has come external to you and brokenness and suffering that you yourself may have even caused. And when you go through that with those friends that you have built relationship with, if you can survive it, and that's the test, it gets tested, but if you survive that, now you're starting to have some friends that you know that you're safe with. And I think another critical part is you can't wait until you're in crisis and go looking. That's right. you like, everything that we're saying is you start looking around this room today and you start thinking, I need to make solid connections because I cannot do life alone. And as you develop those friendships, then when the crisis comes, when the death comes, when the situation comes you don't know how to handle, then you have that dream team, that group that you turn to, that inner circle, that cl the ones closest to you. And as we've tried to point out, we know everyone's life is different. It's seasons of life and, and what it looked like when you were younger, the younger Stephen's, you know, responsibility to family and, and being uh, a father. And you talked about your children as well. That's different from as you're maturing and life is changing and your children are growing up. So we understand about limited resources, but that doesn't negate the fact we need people in our lives. Amen. And that is truly the missing element of most ministries is that we try to do it alone or we just try to, you know, come in and be, be the image we think we ought to be. Dr. Sirstead, you're a counselor. And what would you say to someone who comes in and they just, and you're maybe talking about this with them, their need for this circle of trust, and they say, but I have no friends. How would, how would you help them get started looking in a, in a way of making friends? and creating connections. So the middle verse of the Bible, Psalm 118 and verse 8, says that it is better to trust in the Lord than to have confidence in men. Quite interesting. That does not mean that it's not good to have confidence in men. It means that it's better to have trust in the Lord. And a lot of times when we see that word better, we mean that the we, we people interpret that the other part is not good, but it is good. There is uh, there's a dynamic or a huge spectrum when it comes to social skills, and a couple words that most people understand is extrovert and introvert. And uh, there are those that really look like they like people, and they actually do. And uh, those are what we would consider extroverts. There are those that uh, don't look like they like people, and they don't, and uh, those would be more introverted. It's not that they're not kind, not that they're not, it's just the skills that they have are, are quite varied. And then there's a lot in between. Uh, there are those that uh, have the needs of an extrovert, but they have the skills of an, uh, of an introvert. There are those that have the needs of an introvert, have the skills of an extrovert. They're, so understanding who we are, we're not all the same. God did not create us all the same. There, there's different strengths that everybody has. And so understanding that is huge, uh, very important. Um, I, I believe that there is a direct correlation between trusting another brother or sister and trusting the Lord. I think that when we pull back, and I don't spend a lot of time on the surface, uh, most of my time with people is 
way, 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 way. Um, in, after all those layers have been pulled out, I'm somewhere in the core. So I, I, I speak mostly on the deep part with people. Uh, and when I try to develop a friendship and start there, it doesn't work very good. Uh, but so many times when I'm working with people uh, in, in the social development arena and friends, talking about friends, talking about trust, and, and I hear these words a lot, it's really hard. It's really hard. I believe that there is a, and I've already said it, that, that when we struggle to trust people, if we dig down deeper than that, really, where our trust level struggle is, is with God. And when we can recognize that it's not people, it's me and God, and we can get that level of trust where it needs to be, we can find that place of safety, really, and that vulnerability with God, then we feel a whole lot more, we should feel a whole lot more comfortable with having that trust and that place of safety with brothers and sisters. It's the same spirit that dwells in us that dwells in them. And so, you know, I, I could spend more time on that. I don't want to, I don't want to cheat these other wonderful panelists out on their time, but I, I do believe that we look at things a lot on the surface when developing that friendship really uh, I don't know if I can explain this to where it can be understood but so much of our I, I don't want to over spiritualize our life but relationship is spiritual every aspect of our life there is a spiritual component to it. And I understand who I'm talking to, but I, I spend a lot of my time behind closed doors, so to speak. Uh, most of it is with church leadership. And so I hear what a lot of others don't hear. I hear what's below the, way below the surface. And um, there's so much that uh, if we if we can really trust God, if we can love God, it, it, and again, I know who I'm talking to, I think, um, but we have to have that trust in God. I, I forget the question myself, so I mean, I'm good company. I'm just kind of <laughs> rambling here. But really, it, it's not other people. And so developing that level of trust, I do have to, put myself out there. I do have to open up. And there are those, I use the word intro, there are those that struggle with that. But what it is, is this fear of rejection that's already been brought up. There is this fear of rejection and, and we're comparing ourselves with somebody else, which we're not supposed to do, right? But we do it anyway. And so to be able to put ourselves, take that chance, and what's the worst thing that can happen? We can be rejected by another human, but we still have that relationship with God, that, that trust that we've built with him, that, and he is somebody that sticks closer than a brother. He's a friend that is closer than a brother for sure. So if my, um, what I would say, if you're struggling to develop friendships and trust Look to your relationship with God and, and you will develop a sense of safety that will allow you to trust a brother because the same spirit again that dwells in you dwells in them and that is the spirit of God and we've got to learn to trust God. And I'm not talking surface, I'm talking down deep where, you know, where the rubber meets the road. We've got to learn to trust God. There's a lot of fear uh, in our lives. And the instruction is don't fear, but we fear. And we don't have to fear when our trust is in the Lord. And uh, so.
Well, one of the reasons that we forget our question is because we're so passionate about our topic that we get going, and it's like, I know this was connected originally somewhere back there, but we're just passionate about our topic. You, I think there's a quote on the handout, and every one of you should have received a handout as you're coming in, but you had talked about the only way you know if you can trust is by putting yourself out Yeah, there. so people want to know how, you know, I, I can't trust somebody. I can't, we, trust is broken, and... If you've never broken somebody else's trust yourself, then you've, you, you haven't um, seen anybody else in life. We, we, we're human. We do break other people's trust. They break our trust. That happens. Well, the deeper the, the trust level, the harder it is for many to rebuild that trust. And the only way that we can uh, uh, gain trust in somebody, the only way that we can rebuild trust is by putting them... Uh, in a position in our life where they can break our trust again. Yep. Very and again. That's the only way. There, there, I, I, there's no other way to build trust. Is we have to. We, we can't wait for them to earn the trust if we haven't given them that ability. We have to allow them to break our trust and to give them that chance to regain it or rebuild it or break it again. Which is really scary. It is scary. You know, and so we come into this with walls up and we're not wanting to be hurt. But another question that we have to really ask ourselves, we all know what we require in a friend. We all know what we want in a close friend, what we need. But then a question we need to ask ourselves is, am I able to be a close friend to others? Am I able to be what I want everyone else to be to me? Am I able to be that to others? So we're really coming down to the last few minutes. And we've talked about the need, but maybe you're so aware of the need, uh, aware of the obstacles and challenges. And really what you're saying is, okay, I, I know all of that. What am I going to do about it? And so in this last very few minutes that we have, I just want to put this question out. Um, Dr. Beardsley, if I came to you or someone came to you in this crowd today and said, okay, I need a game plan for building a circle of trust, what would it look like? Uh, we still have 30 minutes, don't we? According to, according I was to my watch. 45, but yeah. Oh, 45, yeah. I mean, John messes up the schedule all the time. Why? why <laughs> I can return the favor, right? All right, I'll behave. I'll stop. So... <clears throat> Hey, I've been waiting 10 years, Rick, for this moment. <laughs> 10 years. He knew it, too. That's why I've never been on this platform this for 10 a, years. This is Stephen's last Come time on with now. us. <laughs> this is my last hurrah. <laughs> Yo, I'm breaking the trust so we can make it stronger. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. I'm taking it off the tracks. So a game plan. So the, f the first thing that I would do is I would assess where I'm at with regard to be real honest with myself about where I'm at about vulnerability. Second thing I would do is I would identify people who I could possibly hope not believe yet, not actually know, but could possibly hope might be able to be that kind of a friend. And third, spend time with them. There is no way to get around it. You got to play Uno. For me, it's Monopoly. Don't play with me in Monopoly. I use real world rules in Monopoly. I had no properties and still won Monopoly. Come see me afterwards, I'll tell you how. You, got, you have to spend time with them. And then as you spend time with them, you will draw closer. That's right. And as you draw closer, You'll do little things of vulnerability. And then you'll do a little bit more. 
and then it'll blow up in your face. And then you have to ask yourself this question, am I going to do this or not? And for Born of Four, I can tell you, we've reached several points where we've had to ask ourselves individually and collectively, are we going to do this or not? And thus far, we've all said, we're going to do this. Amen. And over time, it'll build. You can't, you can't short circuit this you can't speed it up you right. you it it takes investment of time so assess how you look at vulnerability and where you're at look for some people you think you might obviously you got to like them that was the hard part with john i didn't know whether i really liked him or not <laughs> i'm kidding and then you got to go spend time with them and work the process of back and forth and when it, trust is broken, as Brother Sirstead said excellently, you got to give them a chance again. Amen. Because some of the strongest trust comes out of broken trust that's responded to appropriately. So in addition to buying an Uno game or a Monopoly game today, what I think we're going to sum up with some words that I've heard, vulnerability, the, the ability to be self-reflective, and a willingness to do the hard work of heart work. Other things that I think are important to remember that have been mentioned, and I'm just bringing it into a summary, is you're there to be a friend. You're not there to be a board member or, or their pastor or preach a sermon. You're there to, to be a friend, to listen well, not fixing each other, and intentionally uh, getting together. So in the last That's Dr. Five, Miller's job. If you need fixing... <laughs> See her afterwards. No, she has a nice uh, practice. She'll fix all of you. That's her job. No, 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 no. That is not my job. I'll be racing out the door now. All right. It, the last 30 seconds. Um, I'm going to ask each of you to share something. If, you only, if the audience could only take one thing away from everything that's been said today, what would you want it to be? And Dr. Sir said, welcome to the East Coast. You may be from the West Coast, but we're so glad. And you're invited to move here. You don't have to stay all the way over on the West Coast. And you have friends on the East Coast. I'm going to start with you. What would you want the audience to take away? Well... <laughs> 30 take, seconds. Take, yeah, maybe start on that end and work this way. Okay, so Stephen, because we know you're never without a word. <laughs> 30 seconds. See? See? Trust broken. Again. Get started. Shut up, Rick. Get started. That's, that's the simple thing. Get started. You got a handout. You've heard what we said. Get started. Now. Immediately. Today. Today. And I'm not kidding you. Start now. I concur. You can't wait. You cannot wait. It's so needed in the body. It's so needed in ministry at every level, at every age. Um, don't postpone, but um, be vulnerable. And I know it takes time. It takes work. Um, it's not an easy thing to do, especially when you're surrounded by other ministers. And it does hurt. You do fear, what are they going to think about me when I become vulnerable? When I tell them that I do struggle, that I'm human, that I don't have it all together, and my family is not perfect. We may look cute, you know, oh, Sister Brown's kids are always well to, uh, put together. Well, I buy a consignment. Hello? Mm -hmm. Not perfect. Be vulnerable with people. Tell them, let them see who you really are. Let them see who you really are. And just be willing to put yourself out there. That's, uh, be friendly. Love people. Love people. Love people. Dr. Sirstead. So vulnerability is a, is a very important word. Let me throw this in, um, breaking the rules. Some of you are excellent connectors. And in this area of friendship, 
I would highly implore you to take some time with, with people that you know that are not um, outgoing. Be a connector. Amen. Folks that have needs, bring them together. They may not be your best friend. They may not be your great friend, but they have needs of friendship. Be a connector. Bring them together. We do that with Jesus. Let's do that with each other. Mm, I like that. Really good. Really good. Because you never know who might wind up being in your close circle of friends if you just give them an opportunity. I want to thank this panel for sharing with us. I want to thank the team here at Winter Fire for allowing us to be here and allowing me to moderate today. And I want to leave you all with this last thought. A true friend is someone who thinks you are a good egg, even though he knows you are slightly cracked. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Let's stand together. Could we give them a hand of appreciation for sharing their thoughts and insights?